And so every time you look at the benefits of exercise, you oftentimes see these corollaries with fasting. And at some point in this fasting process, your brain, your body moves into a state of autophagy. I've heard that word a few times. Yeah. What, what, what is that? So autophagy or autophagy is how the body gets rid of senescent cells and, and waste products and cancer cells. You know, it kind of eats up that debris and does the housekeeping. And there's some things that increase autophagy, and one of those things is fasting. Um, you know, if you take uh, rodents, for example, and you let them eat ad libitum, they live libitum. as much as they want. They, they will uh, live to a certain amount of time. If you take those rats and you periodically fast them, you can increase their lifespan from 30% to 100%, even though the diet's the same just with periodic fasting or with systematic underfeeding. If you limit, instead of giving them as much to eat as they want, you feed them at 60% of what they would eat if they ate unlimited amounts, and you can dramatically increase their lifespan. It's an, it's an interesting way of looking at it. From my viewpoint, though, they're looking at it wrong. It's not that fasting doubles your lifespan. It's overfeeding cuts it in half. Mm -hmm. By overfeeding the rodents, they're developing fat, visceral fat, they get the inflammation, and you cut their lifespan in half. So what fasting is doing is allowing them to live their full span by getting rid of the consequences of dietary excess. So isn't the game here then just to not eat as much? The, versus fasting. Absolutely. The idea is to avoid excess intake that results in excess fat that results in excess visceral fat. The problem is it's very difficult to do that when they are putting chemicals in your feed that fool your satiety mechanisms and lead to overeating. So satiety mechanisms being mechanisms that tell you whether you're hungry or not. Right. Whether your brain signals you accurately that the amount of calories you have. If you, for example, just sit down and, and eat your fill of whole plant foods. You eat a certain amount and then you feel full. But if you put certain chemicals in the feed, you'll eat significantly more before you trigger those satiety mechanisms and feel full. Those chemicals that we put in our food are salt, oil, and sugar. Salt, oil, and sugar are not food. They're hyper-concentrated components derived from food that are put back into food. And we put them into food to make food taste better. And what tasting better actually means is it results in more stimulation of dopamine in your brain. Dopamine is the neurochemical associated with pleasure. The more dopamine, the more pleasure, the more you like it. And so it turns out that higher caloric density foods or foods that have chemicals like salt, oil, and sugar in the food will stimulate more dopamine in the brain. And that's because your brain evolved in an environment of scarcity. It involved where it was difficult to get enough to eat and avoid being eaten. And so richer foods had more value. And so the people that recognize the value of more concentrated foods tend to live to reproduce and pass on their DNA. Today, we live in a world where we've uh, corrupted the whole system. And so now we have unlimited amounts of hyper-concentrated foods with these chemicals like salt, oil, and sugar. So when you eat those foods, you will overeat. The only question is how much and what are the consequences? Should we be intermittent fasting or should we just be restricting our calories? Are they the same thing? Well, there's different tools available to allow for us to eat ad libitum, but still optimum nutritional intake. One tool is intermittent fasting, that is, or time-restricted feeding, which we've practiced for 40 years, which is basically don't eat three to four hours before you go to bed at night. So instead of eating right up to the time you go to sleep, you withhold calories after the last meal so that you have three to four hours of fasting every day. That gives you a 12-hour fast every day. And if you're trying to lose weight, some people believe you could extend that fasting period another four hours in the morning, do some exercise in the morning, preferentially burning fat. And so that would give you a 16-hour fast and limit your feeding window to eight hours. And what's the benefit of that? Some benefit? people find by limiting the feeding window, uh, they can uh, limit some of the overeating. That a lot of eating is being done for reasons other than being hungry. Sometimes people at night, you know, they've had a big dinner and now they're eating additional food, not necessarily because they're hungry, but because they're bored, they're tired, or they're fatigued. And sometimes when they're fatigued and they eat and they feel stimulated, they think, oh, they must have been hungry, when in reality they were tired. Our suggestion is when you're tired, go to sleep. And uh, when you're bored, you know, engage in productive activities. And when you're hungry, then you eat. And if you limit your feeding window to eight hours, some people find that it's a helpful tool at minimizing some of the overeating. Now, it's not going to work for everybody. If you have very high caloric needs, you know, you're a competitive athlete, eight hours of feeding window, 
particularly on high nutrient density, low caloric density foods, may not give you enough feeding window in order to get the calories that you need. When you're trying to burn 3,500, 4,000 calories a day on very low caloric density foods, you may need to have a 12-hour feeding window in order to be able to get the calorie density need. But for most of us that are trying to maintain or lose weight, having a narrow feeding window uh, may prove to be of, of some benefit. When I'm in a ketogenic diet, or when I guess I'm fasted, which is very rare. Why is it that my cognitive performance seems to be significantly better? Because when I, people have heard me say this so many times, but it's so true. When I'm eating, you know, a normal Western diet, my ability to articulate myself and think and be creative seems to be diminished. Whereas when I'm avoiding carbohydrates and sugar, I seem to be able to think and talk better. I think, again, it may not be that the ketones are helping you think better. It may be that the sugar vacillations are, are interfering with your cognitive function. For example, when people eat particularly refined carbohydrates, their insulin levels go up, drive the sugar down, they end up with low blood sugar levels, which can interfere with cognitive function as a consequence of this vacillation that's taking place with their blood sugar levels between insulin and glucose. When you go on a ketogenic type of an approach or you're in a fasting state, you're, everything's very stable as far as glucose is concerned. And insulin is concerned. Okay, so you don't want to be on the sugar roller coaster if you, you're doing important work. Being stable seems to help uh, people in their cognitive function, so. People talk a lot about juice fasting. And I don't know, there's something about when people say that they're on a juice fast, I always think, oh, God, you're going to be missing important nutrients. You're not going to be getting the same quantity of protein necessarily. Maybe, I don't know, your gut microbiome is going to pay the price if you're restricting yourself from having certain things. Is juice fasting advisable? Is it a healthy approach? So juice fasting isn't technically fasting because fasting is the complete abstinence of all substances. It's a, it's a modified form of eating. So it's a diet that's high in sugar, very low in fiber, virtually no fiber on, on these juices. Where it can be helpful is people that are trying to make dietary changes and they're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brain that comes from the use of their highly refined diets. They're trying to make a change, they're trying to make a break. And because it's sweet and very appealing, They'll drink the juices, they'll get their six or 800 calories, they'll feel relatively satiated, and it allows them to avoid the greasy, fatty, processed foods that sometimes they're trying to get away from. Uh, personally, I think that water fasting has advantages over juice fasting in terms of the magnitude of the detoxifying effect, the impact that it has. But the advantages to juice fasting, or what they call juice fasting, is that it can be done without modifying medications. You're still in a feeding physiology. It can be done safely by people without having to be in a controlled setting like you would for water fasting. So there's advantages to the intermittent or modified fasting approaches. It's not the basis of the research that we've published, which is actually water-only fasting. We're fasting people on water only from five to 40 days. To 40 days. So tell me about that then. So who exactly would you prescribe a 40-day water fast to? And presumably in those 40 days, they have nothing but water. Right, patients that are fasting in our facility are on fractionally steam distilled water only. That's the only thing they take. They're not taking supplements, medications. What is that, fractionally? Well, it's, you know, uh, distilled water. So it's purified water, highly okay. purified water. So in our case, we're using distillation. Some people use reverse osmosis, different ways of getting all the hydrogenated halocarbons and the chlorine and everything out of the water. So just essentially what rainwater would be if the environment wasn't polluted. Okay. Now, in, in, in fairness, not everybody's a good candidate for that type of uh, fasting. In order to determine if you're a good candidate, obviously you, you have to review the medical history and make take a look at what people are doing in terms of their medical treatment, particularly in terms of medications. Basic laboratory testing to make sure kidney and liver function are intact or capable of adapting to fasting. 